Bienvenidos a la sexta conferencia líder en la industria de gestión de servicios y Service Desk en Latinoamérica, SDI 23 MX. BP Gurus y The Service Desk Institute reúnen a los líderes y a las marcas más importantes de la industria a través de webinars, demostraciones y conferencias magistrales. Presentado por... SDI 23 MX, transformando la industria de TI. David Wright es un líder galardonado con 20 años de experiencia en Contact Center, Service Desk, Outsourcing y Servicios Administrados. Su rol en The Service Desk Institute es crear, descubrir, desarrollar y seleccionar valor para el SDI y su comunidad global. Apasionado por el Service Desk, el poder del trabajo en equipo y la búsqueda de la excelencia en el servicio, su misión es defender la comunidad de servicios y soporte de TI, compartir sus historias, desafiar las percepciones e inspirar a los Service Desk a ser brillantes. Hi everyone, uh, my name is David Wright uh, and I'm part of the Service Desk Institute team. Uh, it's great to be part of another SDI uh, MX conference. Uh, I've been to many now and I always love this event. It's also great to be back in Mexico as well, uh, to meet with the, obviously with the Latin American community, uh, with Mauricio, with Yasmin and, 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 and the, the BP Gurus team. Now much of this presentation uh, is based on SDI research that we carried out earlier this year in 2023. And it's about the future of, uh, of IT service management. It's the, it's the life and, and times of IT service management. And the point of the research really is to understand what's happening uh, and has been happening over the last 12 months when it comes to expecting uh, you know, where people have been uh, and where we're going, I suppose, when we look at technology, skills, work-life balance, uh, and well-being. We haven't got a, we haven't got a, a, a enough time to go through everything, so I'll be covering off a few salient points in the research. Um, you'll find using that QR code there that you'll be able to access the research report and download it. So without further ado, I'm going to just uh, put my camera off if I can if I can manage that. There we are, stop video, and hopefully you'll be able to concentrate on on the slides. Okay, so let's have a look what we've got. In this first section uh, of the research, we wanted to understand what organizations are focusing on now and in the near future and how technology is supporting those focus areas. And the first thing to know is that improving experience is the core strategy. We firstly wanted to uh, understand which technology advances had the most positive impact on improving people's work lives in the last 12 months. And you can see there, 27% of our respondents said that cloud computing had the most positive improvement on work, working lives in the last 12 months. So the likes of infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. Um, you can see that that's followed by uh, low code or no code development platforms, self-service, artificial intelligence, and chatbots or virtual agents. Now it's interesting to see cloud computing top there, um, as that could be because more people are working remotely or working in a hybrid model and increasing demand for cloud services as a result. And we can actually qualify that um, because we asked our respondents their primary locations for work. And as you can see there, 42% of our respondents said that they work remotely, 36% said that they were hybrid workers, and 22, just 22% said that they permanently worked from an office location. So that has potentially influenced cloud services as the top choice there. Next, we wanted to know uh, what, what areas of focus IT departments have uh, for the next 12 months. And you can see there, 75% of respondents said that improving end user experience is the main focus for the next 12 months. You can also see as well, improving employee experience is the second choice followed by digital transformation, staff skilling, improving security and enabling a self-sufficient user base. So improving experience is clearly a priority for many 
uh, of our respondent organizations. And to support those focus areas, we also wanted to know what technology advances organizations will be implementing in the next year or two. And as you can see there, uh, the response, 44% of our respondents said that they'll be implementing self-service technologies. Uh, that's followed by AI, machine learning, chatbots, virtual agents, robotic process automation, cloud computing, and cyber security technology. So what does all that mean? Well, there's some pointers here to how organizations are developing the hybrid digital workplace and digital workplace services. And when you look at the inflection points across those results, we can see improving experience is a core strategy supported by secure cloud services, the development of intelligent AI assisted self-service and the democratization of IT through citizens development and low code and no code. And if we look closer at the focus data only, we can, we can break that data down into respondent organizational role profiles to see how each focus area corresponds at a role level. And, and we, you should be able to see that there. Uh, and yeah, so we split that data into role-based cohorts. The cohorts are all service desk staff, service desk manager and IT manager, IT manager on its own and C-level and director. And as you can see, each group has improving end user experience as the top focus area. Three groups include enabling the self-sufficient end user, improving the employee experience and digital transformation as their main uh, other focus areas. And although the C-level and director level also have improving uh, end user experience as their top focus, and like other groups, you can see there, they include improving data and cybersecurity, cost efficiency uh, and uh, cost optimization uh, and improving the, the digital workplace as their main focus area. So it's, it's clear to see there that improving experience, user or, or employee, Improving experience is core strategy. And I, there's a great quote by a gentleman called Aldous Huxley, who was a he was a writer, a philosopher. Uh, he explored the future of society and technology, and he influenced quite a lot of modern thinking. And his quote is, experience is not what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens to you. And I like this statement. I like this statement because it isn't just a philosophical idea. It's a call to action. Life isn't just about events. It's about our reactions, our learnings, and our growth. If we consider what that means in a, in a business terms, especially thinking about the importance of customer experience, it's not the customer interaction that solely matters. It's also the organization's evolution, how an organization adapts based on those interactions. And when we think of, of that in IT service management, the essence of that quote really shines for me. These words push us to be active, active participants, to find lessons in every situation, turning challenges into opportunities. The true mark of service excellence isn't just about aligning with best practice and measuring things. It's about learning. It's about the proactive response and how to improve. And we've all been there when applications or, or a service fail. The, the real win isn't just about restoration. It's about the root cause analysis. It's about the learning. It's about the preventative measures and the long-term continued improvement. And it's not, yeah, it isn't. It isn't just about managing incidents. I mean, in SLAs, it's about harnessing all our experience to refine, to enhance and deliver unparalleled end user and employee satisfaction. So this is a, is a great way, I think, a great way to think about what uh, experience management is really all about. And if improving user uh, experience isn't top of your strategic goals right now, maybe, maybe it's time to reflect on that quote. Remember what Huxley actually said, experience is not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. Okay, so the next one we've got, the next thing to know is in the world of work, your emotional intelligence is more important than your intelligence. Now, that's another quote. I love quotes. So that's another quote by uh, Daniel Goleman, uh, an American uh, psychologist, an author, a science journalist known for his groundbreaking work in the field of emotional intelligence. Uh, and as we've seen, it, or as we will see in our data, emotional intelligence is becoming a very, uh, a very important skill set. We wanted to know about skills development over the next uh, over the last 12 months and, and also what skills we'll need in the near future. And when it comes to skills development uh, to support the future of IT services, we found that 84% of our respondents said that they'd introduced new skills or upskilled or reskilled service desk staff in the last 12 months. And of that respondent group, the majority, 43% said that their skills development are focused on hard skills, so technical skills. And some of the feedback about that 
related to the future skills. We know technology is changing. So the emergence of new technology and the need to shift more technical work into the service desk. The shifting stuff, shifting stuff left, which is absolutely spot on. And 34% said that their focus has been developing soft skills. So that's human skills like uh, effective communication, teamwork, uh, and people skills. On top of that, we also wanted to know if people thought differently about the skills service test professionals need in the next two years or two to three years. And as you can see there, 68% of respondents said that they now think differently about the skills that service test professionals need to possess in the near future. So let's take a look at what skills our respondents think we'll need in the next two to three years. And you can see there, 73% of our respondents think that the most in-demand skill for the next two to three years will be emotional intelligence. And that's followed by problem solving, analytical thinking, adaptability, collaboration, and personal resilience. All those uh, soft human skills. And it's also interesting to see that the lowest performance skill selections here are leadership, technology design, programming, and managing. Uh, they're all seen as diminishing skills needs. Really, really, uh, really interesting stuff. And one more question uh, that aligns with skills. We asked our respondents to look at the number of relationships and select the biggest relationship impact on how organizations practice continual improvement now and how they will in 2028. And as you can see there in red, uh, that's what our respondents forecast. So the biggest impact in relationship is the change from human to data-driven decision-making, followed by siloed to collaborative teams and cost reduction to value creation, which is really interesting because if you look at the link between what that is, these relationships and the skills like emotional intelligence and collaboration or analytical thinking and problem solving, there, there's link, there's a direct link between those. So it's, uh, that's really interesting to see that. Um, so let's think about emotional intelligence as a skill. What, what really does emotional intelligence include? Well, it includes these, a range of abilities and skills related to understanding and managing emotions, both in your own self, in someone, in you, and in others. And these are some of the components of emotional intelligence. Self-awareness. So that's about understanding your own emotions, your strengths, weaknesses, your drives, your values, your goals, and recognizing how these elements impact your behavior and, uh, uh, and the people around you. Self-regulation, the second one there, that's about managing disruptive emotions and impulsive uh, in you. It's about staying calm. It, it's about, you know, staying calm under pressure uh, and thinking before acting. Motivation is the third one there. That's being driven to achieve goals for the sake of the goals themselves, not for anything else, not for additional rewards or external rewards, but just about driven to, to uh, for the sake of the goals and demonstrating energy and commitment and passion when pursuing objectives as well. Empathy, everybody everybody knows what empathy is. That's about understanding and sharing the feelings of others, being able to put yourself in another person's shoes. Uh, and I think that's really obviously crucial from a customer perspective, from a colleague perspective. Um, it's crucial for a, a effective communication and relationship building as well. Final one, social skills. So that's about managing relationships to move people in a desired direction, using skills like active listening, verbal and non-verbal communication and conflict resolution. And although each of those uh, components play their own role together, they help a person understand and handle emotions, help to make decisions, to articulate feelings accurately, to adjust emotions when people need to, to lead effectively and to resolve disagreements constructively. And, and there's a great TEDx, uh, TEDx uh, by David Clifford from uh, Stratford Uni uh, University. You'll see a link to that uh, on YouTube in the QR code. And David talks about three types of people, three people types, i ship people, T-shaped people, and X-shaped people. And the I-shaped person is shaped by education. They uh, usually have deep expertise in one specialized area. Uh, and that's emphasizing logic. So the left part of the brain over creativity uh, the right part of the brain, making them more linear and more siloed. The T-shaped person, on the other hand, has both depth and breadth of skills. And this, this person is characterized by empathy. Empathy allows T-shaped people to understand problems from multiple perspectives, making them more versatile and collaborative. And the X-shaped person, who is skilled, yeah, and empathetic, but also self-aware, ethical, equity driven and purposeful. They're aware of their strengths and have a holistic set of qualities that make them better equipped to tackle problem solving and collaboration in today's increasingly 
complex world. And the cool thing is, emotional intelligence isn't a skill you either have or you don't have. It's a skill that you can develop. Every time I talk about this, people say, well, can you train this? Can you train emotional intelligence? Um, and, and yes, it can be developed over time. So let's have a quick look at, at sort of how to position training people to improve their emotional int uh, intelligence. And training somebody to be more emotional, emotionally intelligent, that involves an approach that combines uh, self-awareness, practice, feedback. And here's an example of, of how that approach could work. So step one there, you can see identifying strengths uh, and weaknesses. You can do that um, it, by using uh, assessments um, or, or questions to gauge the current level of an individual's emotional intelligence and then encouraging the individual to sort of think about and identify situations of behaviors that trigger emotional responses, both positive and negative. And once you've had that conversation um, and you've agreed it, you can move on to step two. And that's about setting objectives. That's about, uh, you know, understanding what the outcome of the first bit is, set objectives on uh, based on the assessment, what you've done with measurable, achievable, relevant and time bound goals for improvement. And then looking to prioritize areas to develop. So by focusing on maybe one of two key areas, things like improving empathy uh, or, or, or self-regulation, regulating your own emotions. That's step three. That's all about learning and expanding someone's emotional vocabulary. That's to help them better articulate their feelings and understand the feelings of other others. This this can include uh, sort of practicing active listening skills, improving empathy and understanding in conversations or mindfulness techniques to help somebody become more aware of their emotional state and regulate responses. And you can use things like role playing, role playing exercises here to, to practice emotional responses and social skills in a controlled environment. Step four, that's about encouraging an individual to, to get feedback, seek feedback from their peers to gauge improvement and, and, and encourage somebody to keep a journal, you know, so they can reflect and understand what's happening. Um, and that's about really about uh, reflecting, reflecting on emotional responses uh, and, and using the feedback and self-monitoring to adjust goals and training methods as you need to. And finally, there's step five. That's about applying skills in, in real world settings. That's about encouraging the application of emotional intelligence in daily interactions, both personal and professional, uh, and encouraging continuous learning, practicing, and, and seeking feedback with positive reinforcement to help make new habits, uh, uh, new skills a habit. Now, that sounds great in theory. It really does. But training somebody uh, in emotional intelligence, it isn't a quick fix. It's a continuous process. It requires commitment, practice, and the willingness uh, from people to step out of their comfort zones. But you know, I, I'm not sure. You know, we may see more of this type of approach in organizations who focus on developing emotional intelligence in their workforce to create more T and X shape people as well. So, emotional intelligence, currently seen as a very important uh, uh, skill to train or indeed recruit. Yeah, that's a big key as well. Uh, and the next thing to know, well, the next thing to know is that organizations who create happy employees are the most successful. Now, nothing new about that. Nothing new about that, maybe. But when we consider employee experience, there are a number of factors that we really need to pay close attention to. And realizing and sort of maintaining a healthy relationship with work has always been a defining factor when we consider the physical and emotional impact on people uh, happy, fulfilled people and teams. So let's look at some, uh, some of the data related to work-life balance and well-being. We initially wanted to know how work-life balance in 2023 and 2022 compared. And as you can see there, 18% of respondents said that their work-life balance was better in 2022 than in 20, uh, 2023, rather, than in 2022. And 8% said their work-life balance is worse this year than last year. The majority of respondents there, as you can see, said that work-life balance was the same as 2022. So that looks relatively stable between 22 and 23. We also wanted to know how emotional well-being in 2023 and 2022 compared. 25% of respondents said that their work-life balance is better this year than it was last year. And 14% said that their work-life balance was worse this year than it was last year. Again, for the majority, emotional well-being is the same in 2023 that it was in 2022. And when we look at the impact of work-life balance on well-being, we also wanted to know how work-life balance is contributing to emotional well-being in 2023. 
43% said that their emotional well, uh, the work-life balance is positively contributing to their emotional well-being. I think that's a relatively positive response. However, as you can see there, 23% of respondents said that their work-life balance is contributing negatively to their emotional well-being. So let's take a closer look at the drivers for those responses. The main reason for improved work-life balance and the knock-on effect to emotional well-being is remote work options. 37% of respondents said remote work options is the biggest contributor to their improved work-life balance. Uh, and we can also see that flexible working schedules feature there as well as another contributor. So it's clear that for many, the ability to work flexibly between home and the workplace is having a, a positive impact on their work-life balance. And when we look at the, the reasons why some people have experienced a, a worsened work-life balance, the primary reasons uh, are increased workloads, insufficient staffing levels, and inadequate salary or benefits. So again, it's clear to see, uh, and it was, this was similar to last year, that for some organizations, the pressure to continue to do more with less is having a detrimental, a detrimental effect, a negative effect on their IT workers' well-being. We also wanted to understand what people thought would make their work-life balance better and what they thought their organizations could do to improve their emotional well-being. And the data here again is very clear. The top responses to both those questions are the same, which is improved salary or benefits. And alongside that, you can see increasing staff uh, staffing levels and reducing workloads. They're both also key to supporting improved work-life balance and uh, well-being for IT workers. And yeah, I think those, again, those responses are undeniable. For many, that old adage of overworked and underpaid is still very much a reality. We've added a few more data points here uh, from the research as well. Again, more in the report, much more in the report. Um, you can see that we put that up earlier. So majority respondents, 42% currently work uh, remotely at home. Um, or, or remotely or at home, I should say. It's not one thing, it could be, it could be remotely anywhere else. 36% of hybrid workers uh, are there too, and only 22% of respondents working from an office. 71% of respondents are happy in their current job role. However, 43% are seriously considering leaving their current roles, even though many of them are happy. And there's another great quote by um, a, a gentleman called Albert Schweitzer, who was a, a theologian, a writer, humanitarian, uh, philosopher, and physician. And that quote is this, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. If you love what you do, you're doing, you'll be successful. And Albert Schweitzer excelled in various fields, not just one. He worked, uh, or he won a, a Nobel Peace Prize in 1952 for his humanitarian work in Africa, and he was deeply committed to improving the lives of others. And this quote, again, for me, uh, is, is particularly powerful, coming from someone who found success in different domains, not just chasing success for, for the sake, his own sake, but by following his passions and committing himself to causes he deeply cared about. And, and I, I like this quote because it flips the conventional thinking that success leads to happiness, suggesting that actually happiness leads to success. It says that when individuals are happy and passionate about their work or a cause, success will naturally follow. And for employers, this quote shows the, the importance of creating a working environment where employees can find happiness and fulfillment, conditions where employees can engage deeply with their work, find meaning and find uh, uh, you know, a sense of accomplishment in what they do. And that's great. That's absolutely great because organizations, the focus on employee well-being and job satisfaction are likely to see that reflected in the quality of work and overall success of the organization with the more pro uh, productive, creative and committed employees contributing to the overall success of the organization. So another great quote there for me, uh, another great one to remember when you're working with and managing people. Happiness is the key to success. And the next thing to note, right now is artificial intelligence is the new electricity. Now we'll come back to that because it's another quote that I, I, I really like actually. Um, now we've already talked uh, or we've seen that, you know, in the next 24, 12 to 24 months, organizations expect to be implementing AI, machine learning, chatbots and uh, virtual agents. 
And to better understand the IT professional perspective when it comes to the near future, we asked our respondents what technologies most excited them, what technologies they were most concerned about, and, and what they forecast for uh, IT service management in the near future. And this is the resulting qualitative feedback. Artificial intelligence features more in, than in this report than in any research report before this, any SCR research report before this, which is really, really interesting. Um, and you can see here some of the respondent feedback. It's not all of it. It's just some of it that we pulled out. You can see AI, yeah, being used uh, for call handling, intelligent systems that can assist end users and analyze and propose recommendations, real-time co-pilots, uh, that technology to help service desks support customers, how chat GPT is seen as a game-changing technology, much like the impact of the internet when it uh, first came out. And additionally, there are concerns such as the potential uh, of making decisions solely based on cost rather than service quality. There's also the challenge of integrating AI into workflows effectively, especially when executive management may be pushing for a premature adoption of this technology. There's some concerns there about uh, business leaders maybe thinking about completely replacing service desk staff with chatbots. And as one individual puts it, it seems we're embracing the positive aspects of AI while turning a blind eye to potential drawbacks, all while hoping for the best. So for some people, it does feel like that. Um, and, you know, a lot of people uh, from, from IT, uh, there's a lot of information in the report about, about all this from uh, IT professionals and what they think. Now, many of us may say, well, this is, this is sort of to be expected in the current climate. And why? Why would we say that? Well, as we know, OpenAI have released... ChatGPT to an unsuspecting world in November 2022, and the internet has gone into overdrive since its release. Within a week, ChatGPT had one million users, and since then, we've seen it develop through a number of releases. We've also seen other organizations trying to play catch up with the likes of Google Bard, Anthropics Cloud, and tools like Perplexity. Uh, Perplexity. We've also seen uh, Microsoft's promise of an AI co-pilot as part of 365. The Microsoft Azure open AI service and chat GPT enterprise with enterprise grade security, privacy, advanced data analytics uh, and analysis capability and much, much more. There's also a host of large learning models that have been launched or updated over the last nine months and so many new tools. It's, it's just crazy at the minute. I think the market has gone bananas. There's so many different tools out there. So uh, very difficult to keep track of them all uh, and the value that they create. Um, and the potential of AI-driven support propositions like AI Copilot augmenting the service desks will, absolutely will, revolutionize support services and influence what service management becomes. All that could mean that currently we're at a tipping point in IT service management and the service desk. Um, and we'll go back to that quote. Yeah, we'll go back to the quote, which is, AI is the new electricity. I, th I think that's a pretty cool quote from Andrew Ng. He's co-founder of Google Brain and former VP and chief scientist at Baidu. I really like this, this concept because it emphasizes the transformational pot potential of artificial intelligence. Just as electricity revolutionized industries and daily life in the past, right now, AI is poised to bring about a similar change, similar level of change by reshaping the way that we live, work and interact. And that comparison to electricity highlights the idea that AI will soon become ubiquitous and foundational, just as electricity has become. And that for businesses, the rise of AI is similar to the moment when industries first harnessed electricity. It's not just about automating tasks. It's not just about crunching data faster. It's about fundamentally reimagining how businesses operate, innovate, and deliver value. And in a business context, you can draw comparisons between electricity that powered the last uh, industrial revolution and became the backbone of modern enterprises and how AI is set to become the backbone and driving force behind the next wave of business uh, transformation in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and just as electricity created entirely new industries and, and products, AI offers businesses the tools to innovate and even pivot to entirely new business models. Electricity helped streamline production lines and opened the, the door to 24 seven, 365 day operations. In comparison, AI will optimize business processes. It'll reduce waste, it'll, it'll enhance productivity. AI will 
improve and drive efficiency at every single level. Just as businesses in the past leveraged electricity or electric powered machinery to scale operations with AI, businesses can harness vast amounts of data to make real time informed decisions using insights to create foresight and intelligent platforms to scale. AI can analyze vast amounts of data uh, uh, instantaneously, and that mirrors how electricity powered rapid communication and data transfer, allowing businesses and organizations to quickly understand customer needs, tailor their offerings, and deliver faster value. And AI streamlines and automates routine tasks. We know that already, ensuring the products uh, projects and services are delivering more efficiency. Um, and this is similar to how electricity have to automate manual processes and reduce production times in the past. And just as electricity brought about innovations like circuit breakers and surge protectors to preemptively address uh, uh, electrical faults and maintain consistent power, AI's ability means that continuous service delivery and, and reducing downtime is going to be the norm, mirroring how uh, electricity uh, revolutionized industry and providing a consistent, reliable power source. And the last one here, because there's a lot of information to take in, I appreciate AI systems are always learning and evolving. And just as electricity made it easier to drive uh, an iterative uh, improvement approach and create more value, AI ensures the product services and processes can be continuously refined to continually deliver peak value. So that's that's what we're expecting. So AI isn't just another tool in a toolkit. It's the new infrastructure on the on which the future of commerce, innovation, and growth will be built upon. And just as organizations in the past century would have been left behind without adapting to electricity, organizations today risk becoming obsolete if they don't harness the power of AI. So that's a lot of stuff to think, right? And I appreciate that was very quick. But with all that in mind, let's go back to the service desk. Let's consider some use cases for integrating generative AI technology at the service desk. Now, we've not seen too many use case examples as yet. So here's an example of what we could see as organizations look to augment the service desk analyst with generative AI technology. Let's start with the pre-human to human interaction. This is before somebody contacts the service desk. This is traditional self-help knowledge and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so you can see that end users are using a generative AI enterprise co-pilot. So natural uh, language processing, automatic speech recognition and speech to text. You see that autonomous agents, they're in place. So they're using chain of thought machine reasoning to autonomously complete objectives. There's also a host of AI assisted activities there like prevention, knowledge, self-help, mm -hmm. self-service, diagnosis, remediation and triage. So that's the, the pre-contact of the service desk. And this one is during an interaction with the service desk. We can see now that the generative AI support co-pilot is in action this time. That's been used by the service desk. That's augmenting the service desk analyst, giving giving the analyst more more opportunities to help uh, uh, the, the 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 end user and create more value. Again, you can see natural language processing, automatic speech recognition, and text uh, speech to text. We also see here though voice analytics. That's not new, um, but in this case, it would be used in a specific way. And desktop analytics, and they're going to be supporting. Uh, generative quality assurance and assisted digital experience. There's a lot more of uh, augmented actions around knowledge, incident man uh, matching, diagnosis, uh, remediation, approvals, deployment, and generative summarization. So listening and, and summarizing information in, in incidents and, and um, uh, service requests automatically. Also, there's more assisted actions there, like uh, creation, creation of uh, tickets or incidents, um, categorization, prioritization, routing, lifecycle management, and escalation. So that's that's the augmented service desk analyst. And then post the call, finally, uh, after the call has been completed or after the interaction has been completed, with autonomous agents completing any uh, related objectives, and that includes ITIL oriented objectives as well, because in this environment and in the near future, ITIL is actually policy as code as well. So it's actually trained, right? These things are trained in ITIL best practice and that's managing some of that best practices. 
policies code. We also see assisted experience management there. There's closure, there's data analysis, along with augmented problem management to feed into problem and knowledge management to feed into, into, into knowledge. So that's an example of how this technology could augment the service desk. And for me, one of the most incredible advances I think we've seen so far since uh, GPT-4 launched is the development of autonomous agents. Now you can see those uh, in red there. So to finish today, let's let's look at autonomous agents. Now this is really, really new territory and some of what we'll go through now is, is quite heavy, okay? So just go with this um, as, some, as some thought leadership to think about, okay? Okay, so the last thing to know today, autonomous agency is the essence of humanity. And that's a quote by Immanuel Kant, uh, a philosopher who stressed the importance of autonomy in his ethical uh, philosophy. He believed that human dignity and moral responsibility hinge on our capacity to make rational autonomous choices based on our own principles. Now, when we look at that in the context of artificial intelligence, autonomy, is a significant part of our relationship with AI and how we interact with it. So yeah, we've talked about this, March 14th, 2023, the latest version of the model that uh, ChatGPT is powered by, GPT-4, was released. That release improved uh, advanced reasoning and the ability to handle more complex instructions. OpenAI also made uh, GPT-4 available as an API for developers to build applications and services. As a result, we've uh, absolutely witnessed unprecedented uh, advances in AI, AI applications. Some people have actually whispered that we're witnessing the birth uh, of early stage artificial general intelligence or AGI. AGI has of late, it's become a bit of a, a buzz phrase, but what is it? Well, for many, AGI is seen as the end goal of AI development, intelligent autonomous systems that can perform any task set to them and potentially do it better than humans. And since the developer communities had the ability to access GPT-4 and experiment, we've seen a number of early stage AGI products uh, projects take shape. Now, one of those uh, projects is AutoGTP. Auto GPT. I always, for some reason, listeners, I always mix up the GPT and the GTP. So yeah, sorry, Auto GPT, which is an experimental uh, open source application that creates chain of thought machine reasoning to autonomously achieve whatever goal you set it. It's one of the first examples of uh, of GPT four running fully autonomously, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with our AI. So Auto GPT can auto uh, autonomously rationalize, reflect, and improve its behavior, give it an, an uh, objective, and it reasons and reflects through a feedback loop of plan, criticize, act, read feedback, and plan again. And it prompts itself autonomously to complete a series of objectives. Now that mean, means it sort of it writes its own code. So this really has have significant implications for the future of work and the likes of ITSM, ITOM, DevOps, and uh, AI ops. So we expect to see the development of enterprise-wide autonomous agents, uh, but we're only really beginning to consider what that means and how organizations integrate this kind of technology, especially how we manage and govern the level of autonomy between different relationships. And that's where the theory of autonomous agency could help. So there are three, three key autonomous agency relationships mm -hmm. in an organization, human to human, human to machine, and machine to machine. And in an organization, leadership and management structures, well, they offer a form of autonomous agency to support the achievement of strategic and operational goals. The, the clearest example of that maybe is the human to human relationship, a relationship where line management is tasked with objectives and goals to either fulfill, complete themselves directly or by delegating tasks to a team of humans. And in this relationship, um, a manager may use a mix of supervised or unsupervised uh, engagement to achieve goals. And the level of autonomy offered and the mix of autonomous agency in this relationship may vary depending on a lot of things like impact, urgency, process adherence, policy, legislation, compliance, contract, service levels, and more. There's also management styles and organizational cultures 
and the level of trust between people that play a part in all this. Many of us, for example, would have experienced the difference between being micromanaged and being empowered while completing uh, objectives. And the concept of autonomous agency acts as a connecting thread in these relationships, supporting operational frameworks and uh, the organizations used to accomplish its objectives. So in that human-to-human -human relationship, individuals have agency to make choices based on, on values, on their values. Organizations promote um, employee responsibility and alignment with organization goals and management offer autonomy and empower decision-making that cultivates trust and teamwork. So that's a human-to-human -human relationship in its basic form in work. In the human-to-machine relationship, individuals have agency to make choices based on their values. Organizations promote, uh, uh, and that's how to use technology, how to use technology um, uh, to make decisions to, to support their own goals. So they have agency to do that. Organizations enable employees to align technology use with organizational objectives and management. Well, yeah, they offer training, resources, and ensure technology is user-friendly to uh, uh, so that, and, and aligned with the goals. And in the machine to machine relationship, mach that's machines in this case, that's uh, you know autonomous agents, as we've said, um, they can have agency and control over their own actions and can make decisions based on their programming and inputs. Organizations, well, they'll be designing the machines to align with the organization's objectives and training them to make decisions uh, that support those objectives. And management will be monitoring. Uh, the machines to ensure machine behavior aligns with the organization's goals. So there's an example of autonomous agency in these relationships. But let's let's focus on the machine to machine relationship and the impact of autonomous agents working autonomously to achieve goals in an organization. Now, there are a number of factors to consider that could help manage the level of autonomous agency in this relationship. And the good news is none of this is new. Why? Well, because IT service management has spent the last 30 plus years developing practices that can be applied to all of the relationships that we've just seen. And some of those practices can be seen here. So they include defining goals, objectives, risk management, compliance with uh, laws, regulations, standards, ethics, security, training, testing. There's data governments in there, there's sustainability, privacy, uh, accountability, transparency. So that's all stuff that we've that we've done in IT service management. Um, with all that considered, managing the level of autonomy in machine-to-machine -machine relationships requires considerations just beyond the technology itself. And that means we, we may need to consider how we interact with intelligent technology in ways that resemble how we interact with other humans. And to do that, reframing traditional work, uh, work frameworks, as well as incorporating new theoretical methodologies, will need to translate into practical things like why, what, and how advice uh, and guidance. And taking that thoughts uh, process one step further, a draft governance framework to support the integration of this technology and manage the levels of autonomous agency in the relationships could look something like this. Now, I'm not I'm not going to go through each of those. Um, there's quite a lot there to cover, uh, but this is a, a working model, a working model framework that the SCI is developing to be released in 2024 as part of version nine of SCI's global best practice standard for service desk. Why are we doing this? Well, because we believe that developing autonomous agency and creating a service management governance framework for the use of autonomous AI is vital to allow organizations to harness the potential of this technology responsibly, ethically, securely, and transparently. And, and also, yeah, use autonomous agency, um, the essence of humanity to shape our relationship with this technology. Now, I appreciate that's an awful lot of stuff, an awful lot of stuff that we've covered in a very short um, space of time, especially the last one. That's a lot of information, but I think I think it's good to theorize, you know, because this is around the corner. This technology is around the corner. Organizations will be looking to implement this to create value where they are now, but wider than that, using, a, using that uh, approach for autonomous agency and autonomous agents um, to help deliver value. A lot of information. I'm sorry if I've lost anybody when we've got through that. Um, you'll find the research report that we mentioned earlier um, using that QR code. So you can use that QR code and you can download the report along with a, a couple of other links as well. So that's me done. That's me done. Thank you for your time. Thank you for 
um, listening. Um, and back over to you. Thank you. Vamos a abrir la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. David está con nosotros. Agradecemos, por supuesto, su participación, el talento y la pasión eh, al respecto. Entonces, recordar que pueden hacer las preguntas en español. No hay ningún problema. Yo las voy a leer en español y se van a interpretar para él en inglés. También las pueden hacer en inglés. Las leeré eh, como ustedes, sea que las vayan a escribir. Y... Eh, vamos a tener el servicio para ambos, ¿no? Tanto en la interpretación en inglés como en español. Vamos a empezar con una que tenemos ya en la lista de preguntas y respuestas. Recuerden el área de Q&A, question and answer, y de ahí las podemos ir revisando. Dice, do you think the use of AI is limiting human intelligence? In the future, can it damage human reasoning? It's a good question. Uh, I think it's how we use the technology, how we govern it. Um, you could ask the question, uh, an opposite question. Will the technology improve our reasoning? So there's, there's two sides. For me, I use the technology daily. I've woven the technology into how I work. It's making me quicker. It's it's. I use the technology as a, a co-pilot. I use the technology as a, as a colleague. I'll ask it something, and then I'll continue to ask uh, and shape how, um, how what I want out of it. And, and that's through questioning. So if I put something in, there'll be a reasoning, it'll come back, and then it'll be another conversation once I've reasoned my side. So I, I think the jury's out. I think, you know, we what, the one thing is, right, I, I don't think we can over-rely on this technology. I don't think we can. I think we still need brain power in organizations. It's how we use the brain power to get better, using the technology to support the brain power and not using the technology to take away the brain power. Um, I think we need to be really careful about that. Joel Bejar, ideally, there should be a committee of acceptance of what AI offers. In practice, there is a tendency to accept as true the result of AI, what should we do? Sorry, give me that again. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, Joel is asking um, the differences between theory and practice yeah. and the reality. So what can we do to uh, to really manage the acceptance of uh, AI in the companies? The, the challenge is it's still so early. You know, that the, the last piece that, that we talked about is, is absolutely theoretical because I think many organizations, including STI, are trying to come to terms with how quickly the technology is advancing. So I think it, you know, it wasn't too long ago where a number of uh, leading brains called for a halt, to stop, just a pause on what was happening. That's not happened. I don't think that will happen. And we've seen all these other organizations now, uh, you know, um, continue to push the envelope on, on large learning models and AI. Alibaba, um, that, that's brought out as AWS. They've just, oh, Amazon have just uh, invested $4 billion in, in, in Claude, Anthropis Claude, which is a drop in the ocean to what Microsoft have, uh, uh, you know, have, have put into uh, OpenAI, OpenAI. So I think it is theoretical. I think we need this, we need these conversations. I think that's, that's, the, that's the point. We can't just let this technology happen because... It's almost right. I, I'm using it in my organization. Other people will be using it in their organizations. The point of me, how I use it, is to get 60% of the way there. I want to speed up what I can do so I can add more value. It it, it sort of accelerates the, the the path to value. So we need this conversation because it's happening. And if you think about that, you know the the and you think about the control and governance around, around IT. If we don't have these these conversations and theorize and then start to practically put things in place so organizations can adopt them, then there isn't going to be any model it'll just be it'll just be big organizations you know like like open ai and, and microsoft sort of sort of pushing the technology in and then organizations just using the, the way they can so i think it's it is still early it is still theoretical there the good news is as i said that there's there's years of best practice that we can that we can use to shape how we bring this technology in we're starting to do that guys so you know Um, Mauricio, Mauricio Kroner, Dr. Mauricio Kroner, and, and a number of eminent AI people we're working with to try to put this idea into a model that people can actually practically use in organizations. So yeah, it's, it is theoretical. It's the start of a profound, a profound change 
uh, to working and non-working lives, guys. Next 12 months is going to be absolutely crazy. So, yeah, it, it, very, very exciting times. Um, I think um, we need to go deeper in the in the in this question because now now I understand what Joel wanted to to ask. How can we tackle the challenge of um, of of human bias of yeah. ev everything that AI offers is true? Mm -hmm. Should we use something like a committee for uh, to to validate what the AI is offering? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you see different groups springing up, you know, in Europe and and, and the rest of the world that that are talking about this. You see some brilliant minds in San Francisco. I've talked to a number of people there who are you know funding CEOs of of of, of AI organizations and. Some of these people have got the answers. There's one a guy called Dan Turchin, who's a brilliant mind. And he talks, his focus is, even though the technology is advancing, is the ethical use of it. It's how we deal with it. So, yes, I totally agree. I think, I think you know, um, any, any large language model that's, that's, uh, that's made freely available in an organization, so, you know, some kind of 365 uh, co-pilot or, or something that's in an organization, it's just important what's outside the organization to understand the bias and how that information is in there uh, and how that information has come out and how it's used. For me, it's still early days. I think I think um, you, you you may have seen on on uh, the the slide set that you know equity bias that's built, that's that's something that's going to be in the stuff that we pull out. We're going to be using some of the greatest brains to pull that stuff out. What we release won't be. Uh, you know, will be one of many, right? Ours will be focused on service desk, IT service operations. It'll be focused around that rather than the, some of the bigger picture. So I think we'll see we'll see these things develop, just as we saw ITIL develop 30 years ago. We haven't got 30 years anymore. We haven't got 30 years. We've got a couple of years. So we will need these, you know, these groups uh, to come together to, to talk. There are groups out there now uh, that are based on ethics and brilliant Uh, groups out there now. I can't remember the names of them to, off, off the top of my head, but some brilliant groups out there now that are talking about this subject. So yeah, it's a uh, it's it's an apps bias and bias and, and and how that's you know how that's um, designed into these, these solutions is is absolutely absolutely top of the pile almost. Yeah. Um, we have another question. Given the rise of uh, what what is having with uh, AI. Do you consider a good business opportunity to develop AI tools? Absolutely. You know, recently, one of the big challenges of uh, an open source language model. So I, I, I use uh, GPT-4. Um, I use Claude. Um, I intermix with them. Uh, the challenge is, of course, it's an open it's it's an open platform. Um, so when you think about data sovereignty, privacy, all that stuff, you know, uh, there is that challenge of where's the data, how's it being controlled. So What's been interesting recently to see a move, a shift to more specific enterprise-wide um, uh, services where it's internal, where it's, it's you know, got enhanced uh, security measures, where you can train it internally too, where you can physically train it internally too. So that becomes yours. So uh, there is, uh, I've been trying to follow the, the market on solutions that have been based on uh, GPT and, and other, other large learning models. It's, it's important. It's unbelievable. Trying to keep up with the the rate of new technologies that have been brought about is unbelievable. I, I've talked about. Um, I, I don't know if you you, you um, you've heard of the, the sort of Cambrian explosion back back way way back in in prehistory. There was an explosion of life on the planet. It's the same thing. Cambrian explosion of new solutions and new ideas have, have just just exploded. So very interesting. I think I think you'd probably see the market fragment. Because uh, not everybody can afford, you know, if you want to buy or sub, you know, sign up for three different uh, solutions, not everybody's going to be able to afford fifty, twenty-five, fifty dollars a month or whatever it is, right? Uh, personally, maybe an organization with this budget. So I think we'll see some kind of centralization um, and and some some sort of uh, some focus on bringing the control of all that into an organization so it can be managed. But very exciting times, guys. Some brilliant minds out there and uh, some brilliant startups as well. Thinking about the future of ITSM, how do you see the IT department will be like in 20 years? Yeah, 20 years. That's a two. Wow, that's a long time. 20 years. Um, 
I, I wouldn't like, you know, I've got my ideas around it, but I wouldn't like to really um, talk in depth because uh, 20 years is a long time. I think certainly if you look at the uh, tw 20 months, I'd probably talk about rather than 20 years. And, and if you look at the sort of next 20 months, the next two years, we've, we've seen organizations trying to wrestle with what this te technology is in an IT series environment. Now you saw, hopefully you saw um, some, some user case information on how it could be used. A lot of it will be, as I said earlier, trying to get things done uh, more effectively, more, more accelerating time to value. That's a, gonna be a key. So uh, organizations who are uh, looking at this technology um, to integrate the technology into workflows uh, and get the most out of it. If you, if you think this is a bit weird, Right, if you think it's a bit weird, but I've always likened what the future of an IT environment could be like is is uh, if you know Star Wars and and you know the the Death Star on Star Wars, if you think about what that looks like, you've got a group of people in their in their headdresses sitting there and they've got a raft of technology around them. There's no service desk there per se. You don't see a service desk. If something goes down, you know it's all it's all working and functioning. And what you have are these people who are almost like monitoring. The, the information and the activity that's going on, which is a big part of what we need to consider, interoperability and how we how we watch what this technology is going. And, and you'll see the technology sort of flash and say, yeah, maybe, what about that? And the, and the technician going, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Let's try it, boom. So there's some control. So there's the, the backdrop of the, the system working to in whatever way it's working, and then the human environment or the human monitoring to watch all this happening. Now, it is a bit odd, but that's where I see this thing going. It's almost going to be the same thing. It's going to be information coming in and out and how humans manage that information flows. Um, in the background, as I mentioned earlier, you still need brains. So what are the brains going to do? Well, the brains are going to be creating. They're going to be doing all the stuff we talked about in that problem solving, all this stuff um, to try and make uh, you know the service more um, uh, the service better, the user experience better. So, uh, twenty years, wow, man, twenty years. I, I wouldn't even like to think about twenty years. It's tough to think about the next twenty months, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, last question, because time is uh, wrapping us up. What would you recommend, or what would you advise to organizations that are thinking to adopt and integrate AI to their service desks? Yeah, it's a good one. I think we're, we're, we're starting to see more of this technology now in, in, in IT, traditional IT service management tools. We did, we've done a, um, uh, some recent um, webinars where we've seen the likes of ServiceNow introduce uh, a large learning model into their solution. So they, they, I think it was, uh, I can't remember the, the name of it, but it was based on... Um, something with Hugging Face, they worked with Hugging Face and then they sort of acquired this LLM and they've started using this LLM. So it's it started, AWS, you know, it's, it started there. Uh, so there are organizations and and Freshworks actually, they, they've integrated one too. So we'll see, I think we'll see traditional IT service management organizations wrestling with this and bringing in their own augmented um, propositions to help manage an IT service use NITL, right? So if you think of that, uh, when I mentioned it, you know, augmenting the, um, the service analyst or the service desk analyst, assisting them, but also uh, having some kind of automated processes and actions going on um, to, to, you know, to change administration stuff or to deploy stuff, all that happening in the background, all at the same time. So yeah, it's uh, that's that's the type of thing I see. I think. I think if I if I, if I, any organization I would I would if they if they're not starting to test this if they're not starting to look at the the technology to test it to, and then to ideate around it to think about how it can be used then they start they need to start doing that now you know so that's that that's where some of these frameworks will come in because it, it'll the, the frameworks will so will cause people to think and to think about how to how to use it but definitely we'll see. We'll see more tools, more IT traditional IT tools using generative technology to help on summarization, uh, to help on categorization, prioritization, to help on um, to help on lifecycle management, uh, to help on uh, augmented knowledge. Um, so that yeah, but I think all all that's to come. I'm watching this space so closely to see which organisations are trying to get there. You know what I mean? And as soon as we see stuff. Our job is to bring it up, just, just, to, just to throw it out into the community, say, look, this is happening. So, yeah, a lot to come, a lot to come on that one. David, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, thank you. Um, any last words before we we, can, we close the session? It's been a pleasure. You know, I think uh, I, I, I always love doing these. I, I think 
I think my only last thought would be, you know, don't be afraid of this technology, guys. I think I think as IT people, as business people, come to terms with this because it's going to happen. We're not going to stop it. The genie's out of the bottle. Um, so come into terms with it uh, and, and, and looking for ways to implement and use it and create value in the organization. That's the focus. Don't we worry, don't we worry about it? Focus is how do we use it? How do we create value? Thank you very much, David. Muchas gracias a todos eh, por estar aquí con nosotros. Eh, re recordatorios rápidos, va a estar la, el video disponible a partir de la próxima semana en el canal de YouTube oficial de BP Gurus. Ustedes podrán ahí eh, revivir cualquier, cualquiera de, nuestros, de nuestras sesiones, conferencias, seminarios. Mm, vamos a, a cerrar. Ya saben, cualquier comentario, duda o inquietud que tengan, al final de la sesión aparecerá eh, un espacio para que ustedes nos pongan ahí cualquier comentario y nosotros se lo podemos hacer llegar a, a David con muchísimo gusto. Listo, pues eh, muchísimas gracias y nos vemos pronto.